The year was 534 AD. The ambitious Eastern Roman Emperor Justinian had begun his restoration of the Roman Empire and the Vandal Kingdom had already been reconquered and reintegrated into the Imperium Romanum. But now the time had come for the next phase of the restoration. The Austro-Gothic Kingdom was to be conquered, the ancient province of Italy where the whole Roman Empire originated from and the city of Rome itself. This is the story of that war which was to restore the Imperium Romanum to its former glory. During the entire reconquest of the Vandal Kingdom, the Ostrogothic Kingdom had been on friendly terms with the Roman Empire. The Queen Amalasunta had been in charge and she was pro-Roman. But she was deposed by her cousin Theodahad, who grabbed for power in 534 and had her imprisoned where she was killed shortly thereafter. Thus ended the pro-Roman policy of the Ostrogothic Kingdom, which was very welcome to Justinian, because this served as the perfect justification for attacking the Ostrogoths. The Ostrogoths themselves had established their kingdom in 493, after the then Emperor Zeno had entitled them as Foiderati with the mission of deposing Odoacer. The very same Odoacer who had himself deposed the last Western Roman Emperor in 476. While nominally ruling for the Eastern Roman Empire, in reality this realm was de facto an independent kingdom, ruled by the King Theodoric from 493 onwards. But all the old Roman institutions were still intact on that kingdom. The Senate still convened in Rome, Latin was still spoken, buildings in the city of Rome were repaired and maintained, and to a time traveler the Italy of AD 520 would look almost exactly the same as for example in AD 470, when the Western Roman Empire was nominally still in existence. Yet. Justinian wanted to reclaim the realm for the Romans, even though the Western Romans still lived with little change from before the so-called fall of the Western Roman Empire. And the ascension of Theodahad was the perfect pretext that Justinian had wanted. After the resounding success of the Vandal War, naturally he felt even more emboldened. And it would again be Belisarius, one of the greatest military commanders in history, that would make this happen. It was thus in summer of 535 that Belisarius left Constantinople with an incredibly small force of only 8,000 men, consisting of regular infantry, Foiderati, 3,000 Isaurians, 300 Berbers, 200 Huns, and his elite guard, the Bucillarii. This made the small force of 17,000 men, with which he had conquered the Vandal Kingdom, look large by comparison. He was also accompanied by the historian Procopius of Caesarea, to which we owe the detailed knowledge of these wars, and by his wife Antonina. A few weeks later he landed in Sicily, where the island was quickly captured with little resistance, since the population was quite inclined towards the Eastern Romans. The Eastern Romans spent the winter in Sicily and in late spring of 536 Belisarius then crossed over into Italy. But it was in 536 that a very unusual event took place, probably one or multiple volcanic eruptions somewhere on earth and Procopius tells us what could be witnessed in his History of the Wars Volume 4. And it came about during this year that a most dread portent took place. For the sun gave forth its light without brightness, like the moon during this whole year, and it seemed exceedingly like the sun in eclipse, for the beams it shed were not clear, nor such as it is accustomed to shed. Recent scientific research has shown that the global climate experienced a drastic cooling in 536 and subsequent years due to the darkening of the sun by volcanic ash. Crop failures and widespread famine would be the result and this would play a big role in the fortunes of the Imperium Romanum. 
Belisarius marched northwards with little resistance, the Gothic garrisons either surrendered or left the southern Italian cities and retreated northwards. Naples was the first city to refuse surrender, but Belisarius captured the city by entering it at night via an old abandoned aqueduct and opened the city gates to his army. Unfortunately, he then lost control of his men who massacred a lot of innocent civilians, a black stain on Belisarius, usually benevolent character, who normally went to great lengths in order to ensure that innocent civilians would suffer no harm. In December of 536 then, he finally marched on Rome and took the city without resistance. The Ostrogothic garrison left the city to the north, while Belisarius entered it via the south through the Porta Asinaria. Thus, after 60 years, Rome was now again part of the Imperium Romanum. But was it the same Imperium Romanum from the old times? And please like this video and subscribe so that you won't miss any future videos on the fascinating topic of the late Roman Empire. And please consider supporting our work on Patreon or via YouTube membership because the long-term sustainability of this channel really depends on your support. As you can imagine, YouTube is not really generous to such a niche topic about the late Roman Empire and consequently the ad revenue from the videos is extremely low. So in order to be long-term sustainable, I really need your financial support via Patreon or YouTube membership. And I would like to give a shout out to our new Patreons. We have two new Restitutor Orbis members, Hugo Garcia and Harold Snyder. Thank you guys for your generous support, I really appreciate it a lot. And we have two new supporters as Kaisar, Owen Driscoll and David Andrews. Thanks guys for your amazing support, I cannot thank you enough and of course I thank every single one who is supporting this channel. Thanks a lot guys because you are making this channel here long term sustainable and therefore possible. Belisarius took up residence in the old Pincian palace, probably a large abandoned domus of an old Roman aristocratic family located on the Pincian hill. Rome during that time was not as splendorous anymore as of old. It had endured three brutal sacks in the 5th century and consequently many had fled to the east. The population had shrunk from 1 million people in AD 320 to between 100 and a maximum of 200,000 people by the time Belisarius entered the city. Many of the old monuments were starting to decay especially in the outer lying parts of the city. Procopius describes peasants that drove cattle through some of the old imperial fora. I talked extensively about the state of Rome during that time in this video here. Yet still, in some parts, the old splendor was still there and the city must have left quite an impression both on Procopius and on Belisarius, who sometimes rode his horse through the Forum Romanum. But meanwhile, the ineffective king Theodahad was murdered and replaced by Vitiges, who was to retake Rome and southern Italy from the Romans. Meanwhile in the east, the Romans had managed to recapture the whole of Dalmatia by summer of 536, first led by General Mundus, but after he fell in battle by Constantinianus. But the new king of the Goths, Vitiges, now had raised a large army of unknown size, certainly a lot larger than Belisarius's, and had started to besiege Rome. Many battles and skirmishes took place in that siege, which lasted from March 537 until March of 538. In one instance, there was heavy fighting near the mausoleum of Hadrian, which by then had been encircled by walls and turned into a fortress. In other instances, the Goths nearly managed to storm the Aurelian walls, but the oxen that pulled their siege towers were shot in time. In addition, Belisarius had ordered the citizens to bring old statues, which were then thrown down onto the storming Goths. We can already imagine the damage this would cause on the old Roman appearance of the city. But the Goths also caught the aqueducts and thus ended the ancient water supply of the city in 537 
and the old imperial baths from that time onwards would cease to function. In order to supply the population with bread, Belisarius had floating mills constructed on the Tiber as the old mills outside of the city could not be used anymore due to the siege. Only when reinforcements arrived from Constantinople in April of 537 and in November of that same year, totaling 6,600 men, did the situation change and Belisarius went on the offensive. He captured cities to the northeast of Rome and came quite close to Ravenna, while the imperial navy cut the Goths from seaborne supplies, thus forcing Vitiges to abandon the siege of Rome. Belisarius then marched to the north, ready to strike the final blow to the Goths. But unfortunately, another ambitious general had been sent to Italy by Justinian called Narses. And Narses did not get along well with Belisarius. It was thus that dissent arose between the two, which made it impossible to effectively organize a coordinated attack on Ravenna. This indecision allowed an invading army of 10,000 Burgundians and Goths to cross the Alps and besiege Mediolanum. Due to Narcissus' and Belisarius' quarreling, no reinforcements were sent in time and thus only a small Roman garrison defended the city. Mediolanum was sacked and severely damaged in March of 539 and many thousands of innocent civilians were brutally murdered. Mediolanum in that time was second in size and population in Italy only to Rome and it would take the city hundreds of years to recover from that brutal sack. To make matters worse, a large Frankish army had now crossed into Italy and the Romans were only saved because disease broke out and the Franks had to retreat under heavy losses. Narses was recalled due to this disaster and henceforth Belisarius would have sole control again over the Eastern Roman army. In 540 then, the time had come to capture Ravenna, the capital of the Ostrogothic kingdom. In the east, the eternal enemy, the Sassanid Persians, were again beginning to harass the Romans as so very often during the course of Roman history. And thus Justinian was very anxious to finally end the war in Italy. He thus sent envoys to Vitiges in Ravenna with very favorable terms for the Ostrogoths. Italy was to be divided, where the lands south of the Po River were to be Roman and the lands north of that river Ostrogothic. The Goths readily accepted these terms, but Belisarius refused, seeing this as a betrayal of everything he had accomplished in this war. The Goths then devised a new plan and offered to make Belisarius, whom they greatly respected, emperor of a new Western Roman Empire. Belisarius accepted and entered Ravenna without bloodshed. The city was not looted and the Goths allowed to keep their properties. However, Belisarius then revealed that he never had intended to become new Roman Emperor and had just used this trick to gain access to the city. Many Gothic garrisons north of the Po River now surrendered and Italy was thus in Roman hands. Belisarius had again achieved the unthinkable. With a force initially 8,000 strong, later reinforced to around 14,000, he had again captured an entire kingdom. The sheer scope of this feat cannot be overstated. Thinking the war over, he left Italy for Constantinople, but this time he was not granted a triumph as after his victory over the Vandals because Justinian had heard of his acceptance of the title of Western Roman Emperor and his refusal to accept the terms of the peace treaty. Vitiges was made a patrician and sent into comfortable retirement by Justinian and many captive Goths were sent to reinforce the Eastern armies. This was then the situation in late 540 and would everything have stayed like this, we could have indeed said that the reconquest of the lost provinces of the Western Roman Empire was going as planned and that this whole undertaking was a resounding success. The Roman losses were small, but two large barbarian kingdoms had been reincorporated into the Roman Empire. Besides the disaster of the destruction of Mediolanum, the losses of Roman civilian life were still manageable 
and all the old Roman institutions were still intact in 540. The city of Rome had not suffered a lot of damage, and a repair and recovery to old glory seemed within the realm of possibility. But unfortunately, things would not stay this way. It would get very, very bad for the Empire, and we shall talk about that in the next video. And if you are interested in the state of Rome when Belisarius entered the city, you can watch this video here in the upper right corner. But if you are more interested in the Vandalic War, you can watch the other video in the lower right corner. I say thanks again to all friends of Roman history. Gratias amici Imperii Romani and bene valete.